before I start on my presentation, I just wanted to follow up. Uh, one of the big reasons that um, the directional drilling is, is, is more effective now and, and the ability to, to drill quicker is because of the bits. Uh, an employee of one of the uh, oil companies out there who was drilling <clears throat> recognized that if they had a better bit, uh, they could improve the drilling technique, the technology, the amount of time it took. Brooke mentioned that it only takes six days now to drill 15,000 feet. Well, <clears throat> in the old days, back when I was working for Halliburton, uh, they would have to change bits about every thousand feet. And you, could, you would go through two or three bits on every single hole. And, uh, and, and so you'd spend a lot of time pulling all of that uh, uh, drilling equipment out of the ground, taking the bit off, putting a new bit on, starting over again, and, and it would take a long time to drill a single hole, especially if you're doing a, a deep hole, 15,000 feet or more. And, uh, but with the new bit technology and the closed loop system and additional circulation, uh, they've been able to reduce that drill time now significantly. And, uh, and then with be the ability to move a rig uh, without having to tear it down, hook a truck onto it and pull it to a new location uh, by doing directional drilling. And if you ever get a chance to go out on one of these mobile rigs that'll move itself, those foot pads that it walks on are, are incredible. It's, it's quite an experience. So uh, my compliments to the oil and gas industry and the efforts that they're making to uh, improve drilling technology uh, and for the indirect positive impacts that it's having uh, on our environment. <clears throat> now when Darren called me uh, a few weeks ago and asked if I'd be interested in speaking at this, I, the first question I asked him was, how in the world did you get my name? You know, I, <laughs> I'm a Uinta County Commissioner from way out on the east side of the state. And, and uh, he said, well, we understand that your commission has been very involved and very engaged in, in many of the issues impacting uh, your, your environment, um, the ground out there, you're involved in, in uh, industry issues, and uh, you know, we are. We're, we're very passionate about use of our public lands. And so we kind of came up with a, a combined idea on, on what I should talk about, and that is the role of local government uh, for our public lands. Uh, so, with that said, that's the topic, managing our public lands. <clears throat> this is a picture of uh, Split Mountain. It's out uh, just north of the Dinosaur National Park in, in part of Uinta County. And uh, your national parks are part of your public lands. Public lands include BLM lands, Forest Service lands, uh, state parks and national monuments as well as the parks. Uh, we have uh, quite a few public lands within Uinta County. Uinta County is one of the larger counties in the state of Utah. We have over 4,000 square miles. BLM is the yellow colored portions of our county. There's over a million acres, uh, makes up 47 percent of our county. The Ashley National Forest in green makes up about 10 percent of our county. Uh, then we have Native American lands in kind of the lavender color, and then our school trust lands make up uh, approximately 8%, and they're kind of dim. They're the little blue squares that you see spread throughout uh, the county, and those lands were set up for helping to um, uh, finance our public schools. Then uh, we, the, the county has direct jurisdiction over private lands, which makes up uh, a whole 15% of our county. So it's important that we understand and work well with those uh, folks, those departments that do have direct jurisdiction over the public lands. And so we work very closely with, with BLM and with our Forest Service friends. Uh, we're very engaged in issues that impact our public lands. Um, you know, Kathleen Clark is the director of public lands uh, for the state of Utah, and we are in constant conversation with her We've especially been visiting with her about uh, issues dealing with sage grouse. And as Tom Mesmer has pointed out earlier, uh, we're very close to finishing up the state plan. Uh, Commissioner McKee, one of my uh, peers in Uinta County, has sat on that 
on that committee. We've worked very closely with Lorian Belton, who is our local working group leader over Sage Grouse, and I hope you'll never move her. We just absolutely adore Lorian, and uh, I don't know if she's here, but please don't ever reassign her. <laughs> um, so as local leaders, we do need to be engaged in the issues and understand what they are. You can't just expect to um, uh, be involved in these type of issues unless you understand what they're all about. We've talked a little bit about uh, air quality. And in Uinta County, we face a real problem with the potential of going into non-attainment. And so I called Amanda Smith the other day and, and I wanted to understand so I could relate to you exactly what it means to go into non-attainment. And when uh, precursors are in such abundance that it causes high levels of ozone, uh, your air quality can suffer from that and you can go into a level of ozone exceeding 75 ppb. And when you do that uh, three times in a year for three years, then you have some very serious issues and uh, the Department of, of Air Quality will require certain restrictions to address that. But before that happens, we can take steps to ensure that we don't go into non-attainment. So we've been very involved in, in the air quality issues um, pertaining to uh, or associated with Uinta County and Duchesne, Duchesne County. And, you know, we don't really understand the physics behind uh, ozone and the creation of ozone because in Uinta County, we have a winter ozone problem, which is very unusual. We didn't even know we had a problem till just a couple of years ago. Typically, ozone issues uh, surface during the summer months. And uh, so we didn't even think or didn't know uh, we had a problem out in Uinta and Duchesne counties. However, we, we had some readings uh, uh, from some of our air monitoring stations that indicated we were going into uh, a level of ozone that was not acceptable. Uh, industry has been very um, aggressive, very engaged in helping to reduce ozone levels. Uh, and that is without any requirement from DEQ or uh, from EPA. Uh, they have done that voluntarily. As has been talked about, there, they've taken many, uh, many uh, steps to address the ozone issue without being required to do so. Um, yesterday, Jim Gazewood, is that right? Jim, thanks, Jim. Uh, talked about best management practices. And when these EAs are put together, they determine what are the best ways to, uh, to access the natural resources found in, in uh, these lands in the Uinta Basin. And we've talked about many of them today, uh, uh, yesterday and today, uh, reducing the footprint, um, improved access uh, to the locations, improved drilling techniques. Um, many of the companies are moving away from trucking the water. They're moving water uh, by pipelines now, and they're treating the water so that it can be reused. Anadarko is an excellent example of one of those that is doing that. Um, anyway, the, the, the point I wanted to make with industry is that uh, they have worked very aggressively in um, minimizing the impacts that they have on air quality. Um, so you don't have as many trucks on the road, you don't have uh, as many water trucks hauling to and from the locations, they're piping much of it. And in fact, the polypropylene piping that they use is you'll, you'll go out there and see it laying right on the surface. They don't bury it. And one of the reasons for that is because it can be moved, it can be reused. And so after a location has uh, gone through its lifetime, that ranges anywhere from 15 years to 30 years. Uh, it, it, but eventually the, the production out of a well location will end. And then those polypropylene lines, heavy duty, very thick wall, can be moved to other locations and reused. <laughs> You've heard a lot in the last two days about sage grouse. You'd think this was the sage grouse summit. <laughs> uh, this picture was taken by John Sturmer. He's our civil attorney at Uinta County. It was taken up on Diamond Mountain. And uh, that is an area that as community leaders, we have worked very hard to improve. The habitat up there is excellent. There's lots of sage brush. 
uh, lots of um, uh, protection for them. A lot of the landowners up there have worked uh, very closely with us. We have identified 46 miles of road that can be uh, vacated or eliminated from the transportation plan and, and gradually reclaimed. The roads that they would use, and they're, they're primarily ranchers up on Diamond Mountain, uh, they would require fencing, and so they, we've been able to remove fencing. We've helped with that. Uh, so the habitat or the core areas that we've talked about a little bit are, for the most part, located up on Diamond Mountain. And it is one of the sage-grouse habitat areas that has been increasing over the last 10 years. Uh, Miles Hanberg, uh, who works out uh, in our area, uh, has been working very hard on this issue, and Lorian Belton as well. And uh, the sage-grouse population has been on the increase for the Diamond Mountain area. As local officials, we're also very involved in wildlife habitat. <clears throat> As you are engaged in different uh, uh, issues, different projects, you have to keep in mind the impacts that they're going to have on the wildlife and what times of the year you can work on those, especially in dealing with roads, road construction projects, uh, what are the breeding seasons, what are the times of the year that uh, you could impact the wildlife. And so we're very careful about uh, the impacts that we can have uh, on wildlife in our area out there. We have a very diverse uh, uh, amount of wildlife out there. We have deer, we have elk, we have um, just about every kind. Bear hunting is extremely popular down in the southern end of Uinta County. Uh, we have lots of uh, mountain lion hunters out there. And so, you know, we, we want to see these uh, wildlife issues uh, followed very carefully. We work very closely with uh, Bill Stringer, who is the BLM director out there in that area, Mike Stewig, uh for the Uinta Basin area. Uh, it's important that, well, l let me just say that a few years ago it was more of a loggerheads with, with some of these agencies, but we determined a number of years ago that we would rather be successful in working closely uh, with these agencies in dealing with these issues because they're important to us as local leadership. For example, uh, we're putting in what's called the Seabridge Road. It's an existing road and we're making improvements on it. Uh, but we are uh, installing six oversized uh, crossings, underground crossings for these um, uh, critical uh, deer habitat areas. Oil and gas is very important economy in Uinta and Duchesne counties in the Uinta Basin. And there has been some talk about Anadarko and the EIS that they just successfully completed in cooperation with BLM, 3,700 wells. Uh, this is a number of other uh, wells that are going on. Gasco was just approved. Now it says proposed 1,500, but I think they approved 1,200 wells for Gasco. Um, these are some of the major players, XTO, Newfield's not up there, uh, Questar, but we have right now in Uinta County over 6,000 active wells. Over the next number of years there are 30,000 wells that have been proposed for the Uinta Basin. So that demonstrates the, the absolute necessity of working very carefully with these best management practices and doing those things that will mitigate the impacts to our environment. We live out there, we love the land. Uh, and, and we have families who, who live off the land and who have jobs out there and, and they don't want to see those go away. They want to be successful in their businesses. They want to have uh, a, a nice uh, lifestyle for their families. They want to provide for their families. So it's very important that we work together to reach common goals as we deal with uh, these issues like the sage grouse. And Well, for example, the Graham's Penstemon uh, which is an endangered species. Uh, it's located along the Seapridge Road and in an effort to um, not impact that plan as we put the road down through uh, one of the areas where the Graham's Pensman is located, we literally went out there and dug the plants up uh, that were in within the road right of way. Now those that are outside of it, of course, we left alone. But uh, 
we, we transplanted those as best we could. BLM had a team of, of folks that went out, of biologists that went, not biologists, who are the plant people? <laughs> of those who are involved with the plants, uh, we went out and, uh, and physically relocated those plants that were in the, uh, that would have been um, in a few years past, just graded over. Gasco is uh, one of the companies that we've talked about. Uh, they play a very significant role out there in the basin. Uh, Questar. Now, we've talked about a lot of the things that industries have, have done as part of their EISs that are required in their plans to do. But in addition to that, they do a lot of extra things as well that are community related. And Adarco that uh, Brooke was talking about, they donated a million dollars towards a wing of our Applied Technology College. Uh, Questar voluntarily refills water plants out in the southern end of Uinta County. They're not required to do so under any of their uh, EISs. They do that as a service. It's for the wildlife and for the ranchers. Um, so Questar is very involved with uh, the Division of Wildlife Resources. They've participated in sage grouse studies. They, as I mentioned, they uh, fill small wildlife and livestock ponds. Um, they've helped build live, or, um, uh, hawk nests as well. Uh, so all of, our, all of the companies that are out there are engaged in these types of things. They're very aware of the impacts that they have, and so they try very hard to uh, mitigate or do other things to, uh, to help with uh, the land that we live, work, and play in. Oh, and I, I don't need this slide now. Brooke talked about their uh, water reclamation. They're a, a leader in the industry in treating water. They have a water treatment facility that I went through. They, they have a water treatment facility that I was able to go through the other day. And they, the water that they use in their uh, production is uh, collected and brought to a local facility where it runs through a filtration system and then an RO unit, uh, which is not cheap. As many of you are aware, reverse osmosis is a very expensive way to treat water, but they, they do that so that they can reuse the water uh, throughout their system. Another area that we work very closely with is also with our parks. Uh, this is a picture of our Dinosaur National Monument field house. Uh, a few years ago, it was condemned because the land was beginning to move and the, the I-beams were literally pulling away from each other and it was in danger of collapsing. This facility has been reopened. Uh, the famous Wall of Bones, I'm sure many of you have been there. It literally has uh, dinosaur bones embedded in the wall. And it's open to the public now and they can go in. You can see this dinosaur skull. We worked very closely with them as they reopened this facility. Our travel and tourism hosted a, 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 a huge gala affair where uh, we invited people from all over uh, the state of Utah and from around the area to come and participate in the open house. So this is a, just sort of a, an invitation, not sort of, this is a, a blatant invitation to come out and, and see uh, this national monument that we're so proud of. We also have a number of state parks and we work very closely with Mike Murray, who's our uh, state park director out there in that part of the world. Um, Red Fleet is a beautiful little lake that not very many people are aware, are aware of. Uh, we enjoy uh, going out there and seeing the dinosaur footprints that are located on the north side of the lake. We also hosted recently the Utah Rock Art Association. The Uinta Basin is well, very well known for its arc sites uh, throughout the state of Utah. The McConkie Ranch is located uh, out north of Vernal, and many uh, uh, famous petroglyphic panels are found out there. Uh, we work very closely with them. Uh, they have decided that Vernal is the best place to come and, and have their annual symposium, but we invite you to come out and see some of the arc sites that we have out there. Now, the, probably the, one of the greatest responsibilities that we have is maintaining our transportation corridors throughout the county. And we are responsible for the roads in all of our public lands, whether they're up on the forest system or in the, on BLM lands. Uh, we help maintain them and keep them open. We saw this photo earlier uh, with the dust, and we've talked about the, the impacts of dust uh, on our environment. 
so um, that wasn't the sole reason, but one of the reasons why we decided that we needed to improve the Seep Ridge Road. If someone was driving on the Seep Ridge Road and you got behind them, you wouldn't be able to see for miles because of the dust. It was the kind of road that um, frequently deep ruts would, uh, would be created in, in it, and it's one of our major oil and gas transportation corridors. And so uh, th there have been numerous studies over the years to improve this road. Uh, we finally decided to make it a priority. And so we, uh, we uh, went to our, uh, C or not our, the CIB board. Some of you are familiar with that, the Community Impact Board. We were able to get uh, some low interest loans for 30 years and some of our transportation money towards this road. And, um, as part of our improvements to this road, we have included six of these culverts. Now that's a D6 cat on top to give you an idea. And then there's a dump truck behind him. That's 28 feet. And it looks oval, but it's actually round. It just must be the way it's cut. Uh, it's 28 feet round. Uh, and then there's a, 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 a dry bed in the bottom for uh, the deer to cross on. Uh, we actually have a meeting this Friday uh, to talk about the fencing uh, that, will be, that will be necessary to guide deer to this crossing. Uh, we're not sure that uh, elk will, will want to use it. Uh, I understand that elk would rather go over the top. <laughs> so uh, anyway, we are working very closely with the De Department of, of Wildlife, with DWR, uh, in finishing up this project so that we can move forward uh, with the Seep Ridge Road. This is on a portion of the road that's north of that, uh, which is complete. And uh, we have been, as you can see, that's uh, a portion of the county where the, all of the oil and gas is located. It's very conducive to oil and gas development. At any rate, um, your, your county commissioners, wherever you live, you, somewhere in the state of Utah, you're in a county, and many of your municipal leaders should be, if they're not, they should be very involved as any of these types of projects move forward. And so if you're talking about uh, oil and gas industry or um, development of your roads um, in endangered species issues, uh, in air quality, your local leaders need to be involved uh, in these issues. They need to be engaged and aware of what is going on so that they can sit at the table and represent you. Uh, you know, it, it, you're part of a community and your local leaders need to be involved and engaged in these issues so that you can work together with all of the agencies, whether they're federal or state. Uh, we just need to work together as we work and solve on these problems as we move forward. So thank you for your time. Uh, we do, we also host a, a, um, a unit. Um, these are active military. And so wherever they go and they travel all over, they take our flag with them and, and send us a picture back uh, wherever they're at. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, there's my contact information. If you need to get a hold of me, you're welcome to do so. Uh, thank you, and with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, the, the question is concerning the Seep Ridge Road and what are our plans for that road. Um, that is a 46-mile road. We currently have completed 22 miles of that road. The road goes south uh, of State Road 88 from Ore south to the uh, Uinta County line that borders with Grand County uh, from where the State road ends, um, that's 46 miles, and like I say, 22 miles of it is done. So we still have about 44 miles left to, to go. The, um, the, the, the groundwork has, has started, and we plan on finishing that next year with the exception of a small amount of paving that will be completed probably the year after that. But our goal is to pave that road all the way to the uh, Uinta County line. Okay, the question is oil and gas one of the major contributors to air quality issues? That's an excellent question and I wish I knew the answer. I know that the, uh, uh, um, the 
scientists or technicians at Utah State University wish they knew the answer to that as well. One of the things we do know is that to have winter ozone, you have to have an inversion and you have to have snow on the ground. <laughs> and I, I was on a radio program once where I, I said, you've got to have snow on the ground. And a caller called in and said, are you crazy? Snow creates ozone? But it does. Somehow it is a factor in the formula uh, and with the precursors in creating ozone. Now, the big question is, is oil and gas part of the uh, precursor? Are the emissions that are coming from oil and gas a factor in ozone creation? In and of themselves, uh, we don't know the answer to that. This last year, we had absolutely no, uh, um, what do you call it when it goes above the six or 75 ppb incursions? Exceedances, thank you. This last year, oil and gas production, exploration slowed down, but oil and gas production in the Uinta Basin did not slow down. But we didn't have a single exceedance. In fact, for the whole winter season, it didn't get over 45 ppb, uh, a very unusual year for us not to have snow in the basin. But we didn't have any snow and we didn't have an ozone problem. Oil and gas didn't slow down. You know, it, it makes you wonder, are they part of the problem? They very easily could be, and they recognize that. And consequently, to avoid going into non-attainment, they are already taking steps to minimize the potential impacts that they're having on the precursors. Um, but, you know, even if there wasn't oil and gas out there, would we still have ozone problems? We don't know. So, good question. Thank you. The question is, um, what was the agency or what, who did we work with and what was the process? And in that process, uh, who determined, and I'm summarizing, the deer crossings and fencing associated with that? Um, the EA was done by the BLM. Uh, we had a Title V on the Seapridge Road, an existing road, but we requested to the BLM that we increase or that we move that Title V from a uh, maintained gravel road to an asphalt surface. So they took uh, the time that they needed to complete an EA. That process ended up taking about two years because they knew there would be uh, some um, uh, questions about it. Uh, and so they were very careful to address all of the impacts, all of the issues associated with improvements to the Seapridge Road. One of the issues associated with, with that was a portion of the Seapridge Road goes through a critical deer winter habitat area. Now, I don't know if I got the terminology exactly right, but the Seapridge Road goes through a critical winter habitat area for deer. So in the uh, EA, they required six deer crossings. Uh, we're currently working on those. You saw a picture of one of those six. And uh, we are, and after those go in, there's no, a deer crossing doesn't do anything for you unless you have a way to get, to move the deer towards that crossing. Uh, so we are working very closely with, with uh, DWR in how we're going to get the fencing in, the funding for it, uh, who can we get funding from, uh, we will, by the time we're through with the Seapridge Road, uh, the county, the transportation district, and the CIB, uh, plus other uh, people who have, who have contributed to the Seapridge Road, will have spent in the neighborhood of $80 million. We have used every resource we possibly can as a county to fund this road. We feel it is that important. We don't have any money left for fencing. So we are working with other stakeholders, uh, with, the, with DWR, and coming up with people who can help us come up with the funding that we need uh, to put the fencing in. Otherwise, our crossings are, are not going to do us any good. So. But you mentioned the uh, endangered grounds Kenston. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more on, on how the Kenston is, is doing on the whole? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I confess to a certain perspective on the Grams Penstemon. Um, th the more they look for Grams Penstemon, the more they find. 
Um, are they endangered? Yes, there's no question about that. But what we have found, especially as we have had some disturbance on this, is the more we disturb them, the more they come back. Um, I don't know what that's going to do to the listing, but I'm certainly not a, a botanist or a biologist or a plantist. Plantist? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it appears to do well when it's disturbed. Um, however, we did not take it lightly. And that's why at one point during the process of this, we sat down together with the BLM uh, to determine how can we, and, and I use this word a lot, forgive me, but how can we mitigate the impacts that we're going to have on those plants that are within the roadway. And so we determined to move those as best we could. We had one of our contractors um, donate their time. They literally took a bucket and got underneath the penstemon so that they wouldn't break up the root bundle and literally put those in these big um, planter buckets, the wooden ones that are like a half a barrel, and, and move those. Some of them are out at Thanksgiving Point. Uh, some of them were transported to another location and relocated. Uh, but we also identified several other uh, plant areas around that that we have kept uh, confidential just because the curious have a tendency to go out and and try and see them and stuff but uh, we were very careful and very responsible as we tried to relocate any Graham's Penstemon uh, at a significant cost that were right in the roadway. Thank you Mark. Thank you.